This showing of That Mental Ginger Show will contain adult themes and strong language. So if you don't like it, you can f*** off. Alright trip. <laughs> Hello and welcome to That Mental Ginger Show with me, Andy the Mental Ginger because if there is one thing worse than being a ginger it is being a ginger with mental health issues. Now my three faithful followers we have a very special guest today but he is a host on Scotland Rocks Radio, he is a teacher up in Stirling and well, an avid hill walker, Jack Reed. Jack, thank you so much for coming on the show. Not a problem. Thank you very much for having me. Delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm delighted yeah. to have you, buddy. It's been it's been ages since we've seen each other. Yeah, but I think it's what, been about it must have been about six, maybe seven years. Or something. Uh, like I that. got together with the misses uh, as we were graduating college, mm -hmm. so that would be about eight years. Wow, eight years. I think we've maybe maybe met once after that at some event but yeah yeah it was probably we probably have old age is kicking in right. <laughs> tell me about it well it, do, it doesn't come itself i'll tell you that's it so since then you went on to what become a university student yep. Napier mm -hmm. university. i did i went to yeah, Napier university became a drama student um i then went on to become a drama teacher so i'm their secondary school drama teacher so um, tell me a bit about that what because we always had the what's the cantankerous relationship with some of our lecturers at college and mm. now you've converted to the dark side of the force yeah that's very true and right. very apt because i'm a massive star wars fan uh, um, yep. but a uh, uh, drama teaching is it was something i was always interested in when i was a, when i was a kid and i think that's kind of what my main goal was going through college and university but yeah we did have very different relationships with with lecturers that you have with teachers but that's a moral responsibility as a teacher but I've also got this alter ego where I'm a, a massive heavy metal fan as well so yes definitely it was one of the things well we connected quite well on certain subjects yep Star Wars good Batman yep anything superhero related yep and metal music metal music what got you into metal music so well it's quite strange actually because my my mum was primarily into kind of like punk music I'd say she was like really into like her punk at the time and kind of 80s like rock bands and but nothing really heavy um so and would you say she was more the glam rock kind of style mm, probably more like your kind of simple minds and your um uh, my mum was like a big fan of like the stranglers and stuff so there's quite a, yeah. a strange variety there mm -hmm. and my dad was really into it. again I mentioned simple minds he was a massive simple minds fan and he was quite into, I remember like growing up in the 90s there was a lot of trans and electronic music going about at the time so my dad was um, really into his, his kind of varied music there. Dipped into some rock bands, I think the heaviest we would ever really go when I was growing up was like Guns N' Roses. Um, nothing wrong with Guns N' Roses. Nothing wrong with Guns N' Roses at all but then as I kind of progressed um, I remember, it must have been about 2006 Seven, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it was the kind of guitar hero craze that was going on at the yes, time. Yes, the and PS2. Yep, the PS2. And what else was there that was going about? It was the School of Rock. That was the, the big, the massive influence. I went to watch that. And my uncle at the time was into kind of classic rock. And um, I just remember hearing it was Metallica 1 for the first time. Uh, it must have been about 2007. And I just, it's like something just clicked. Like, where has this kind of music been my whole life and and if you know anything about Metallica 1 it's got this really sweet kind of soft intro and it's got this really heavy outro yes. and then from there that kind of got me into the thrash stuff and, and then I discovered my, my one and only true love which is Iron Maiden and um, yes. uh, just it was like being born again like listening to this stuff because I was although my family are massive music fans there was nothing really heavy and I was kind of the black sheep of the family from that point because it was always like, don't ever give him the USB cable, don't ever give him, you know, the CD privileges because he'll just put on that mad mental stuff. So, yeah. Oh, that just reminds me of my childhood so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
because when I was growing up, it was the rise of the new metal screamo kind of yep. scene, mm-hmm. funeral for a friend, mm-hmm. like biscuit, like in park, all that kind of stuff. And it was the same deal. It was like my mum and dad what thought they'd achieved higher status when they got the six CD changer for your car. Yep. And they would check every CD port just to make sure that I hadn't put anything in mm-hmm. that wasn't key. Yep. Or Coldplay. And no Slipknot, none of that stuff. No Slipknot, no Limp Biscuit. Well, they were okay with it in mm-hmm. the house. They were all right with it. I have to I have to give them their due. My mum was more of a rocker than my dad, which surprised me at first. When my dad said that he wanted to put on the Beach Boys, I lost a bit of respect for him, I cannot lie. And then when uh, my mum said, oh, I actually got your dad into Guns N' Roses, which, mm-hmm. as you know, is my all-time favourite band of that era. Yep. I was quite surprised because he gave me his original Guns N' Roses belt buckle okay. to keep. Girl, and I looked really at it and thought, has this been a lie? <laughs> I thought I knew you. I bought you something from the Guns N' Roses concert I went to and nothing for me. I don't know. The Guns N' Roses belt buckle with the Beach Boys leather belt right mm. the side. And, I, and a U2 bandana. We can't forget his U2 bandana. His Achtung baby <laughs> bandana. My dad was into U2 as well. I think my dad was one of the ones that kind of influenced Queen as well. That was a big one when I was there. Uh, I did like U2. I think I was the only member of the world that was gutted that he didn't have Apple to get the free U2 CD. Yeah, you're definitely the only person in the entire world. I was the only person. I woke up shocked when I had a free U2 album on my (laughs) iTunes. If I'd known, I would have been like, can you convert it to MP3 (laughs) so I can get it and listen to it? (laughs) Because one of my karaoke songs is Angel of Harlem. Okay, yeah. I absolutely love Angel of Harlem. And I remember doing it in karaoke and my dad going, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, why? What? Because some people don't like you too. And I'm like, well, then those aren't my people. No, that's it. You've got, to, you got to stick to your music. You yeah. too has not always been my thing, but it's... I can respect them as musicians. And what would you say, Bar Iron Maiden, has been the best concert that you've ever been to? As we are fellow, what musically inclined people, I would say actually that the Iron Maiden are. Oh, I've seen them about eight or nine times. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. Would travel thousands of miles and have travelled thousands of miles mm. to go and see them. You've been um, to download, haven't you? Been to download. Been to. I, I, I flew to. I, I went to Seattle when I was about sixteen and. Just by chance, Iron Maiden were playing at the same time. And just by chance, we went to go and see Iron Maiden. That was, I think, that was my first time going to see them as well, me and my uncle. Um, and uh, but I'd say the best concert I've ever been to, hands down, has got to be Ramstein. It's got to be Ramstein. There's, Aww. there's nothing more epic than a Ramstein concert. And I think even I, I went with my sister and, and my girlfriend at the time. Still is my girlfriend. Girlfriend at the time. Girlfriend. Sorry, uh, Kaylee. Sorry, Kaylee. Um, and uh, when we went to see Ramstein, they're not massive metal fans, but they, they do like Ramstein, and I think Ramstein do appeal to a kind of greater audience as well. Um, but just watching their show alone with their pyrotechnics and their fireworks was just mind blowing. Mm. And uh, I remember getting it was in Milton Keynes Bowl, if you know that one getting into Milton Keynes Bowl and the stage went over the top of the stadium um, and the light show was just incredible, brilliant, fantastic, that's the best thing I've seen, definitely. Now, you're a host on Scotland Rocks Radio with yep. your own show Ironworks, that's which it. is on, on Thursdays at 7pm, Thursdays at 7pm. I am an avid listener, Good. Well, so on Thursdays I always try and make sure the boys are in their bed, whether they're awake or not it's a different story, mm-hmm. but I do try and make sure they're in bed so I can listen to it while I'm doing like, some uh, editing or whatever. Good. I'll try so, and put a disclaimer on some of it because there's quite a lot of heavy screaming swearing and stuff like that. I'm, I'm definitely fine with that, that's one of the things I love about it. <laughs> So how did this opportunity come about? So it was it was as most things that are happening now. It was to do with lockdown. I think primarily it was living in the um, you know this co- this this COVID nineteen world that was two thousand and twenty, and it got to about March April time, and I'd work was kind of drying up. As I said, I'm a teacher, so it was coming to summer holidays, and nothing was opening, and I was like, okay, what can I do? And obviously, I'd love metal music and. I had a pal that was really into metal music as well and I thought, do you know what, why don't we just set up some microphones and we'll just talk 
and we'll just see if people want to listen to it. And but it was never, it was never like, oh, I'm going to do a podcast because we're the podcast guys. It was like I just want to chat about metal and see what comes of it. So we came, uh, he came round, and we just sat and spoke for a good hour about the stuff that we liked and what was going on at the scene at the time. And then I shared it, put it out there, didn't think anything was going to happen of it. And then within about two days, Scotland Rock Radio got in touch and said, we really liked your show. How would you feel about, you know, becoming a DJ? And at the time I was like, no way. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't have the energy for this. And I was like, nah, I, I, this seems like too much of a big opportunity. And they were like, I'll tell you what, why don't you do a pilot show and we'll see, we'll see what it's like. Um, tried the pilot show, they loved it, and they just said, yeah, we're putting it on and we'd like you to do weekly shows for us, and I accepted, and it's became a big part of my life now. That's so. absolutely amazing. Yeah. I try and go back to the podcast every now and then, because I know that people quite like listening to them, but um, with the whole COVID-19 stuff, it's difficult to get guests in, so... Right. Details of the podcast for mm-hmm. um, people who may not know, obviously I'm old myself, but feel free to give it a plug, give a plug for the podcast. Uh, for my podcast, mm-hmm. for my podcast, it's just basically general chit chat. What's going on in the metal scene? And yeah. What's it news. called? So people can. It's, it. it's still under the Ironworks name. It was called Iron Review originally, but we changed it just to coincide with the show. So it's just the Ironworks podcast. It was on Spotify. We've now taken it down from Spotify, but it mm. possibly when we gain more traction, it will go up again. Oh, um, but you can get it all on YouTube um, today, and I'll send links over so you can definitely access it. So- Feel free to like, subscribe, like, give him as much love as possible because, Fantastic. believe me, this boy has definitely earned it. And if you love metal music, tune in every Thursday, 7 pm, our works because that's where all the you know good new stuff and heavy old stuff kind of kicks in. So. Only place to be. Only place to be. <laughs> so, one thing I was quite surprised that he did like was uh, your hill walking. Yeah, that's a recent thing as well, actually. Is that yeah. was that a result of lockdown as well? Um. So that yeah, I'd say that was. I mean, my granddad was a was a hill walker. You know, mm. he he um, was a Monroe bagger. He didn't I don't think he got ever to near the all of them, but he did. I think my granddad said in the seventies, and he was a bit older. So by the time I came around, he his kind of days of hill walking and stuff were kind of behind him. Um, I do remember him doing bits and pieces, but you know, he was coming up for his seventies and. Um, I was still, you know, maybe eight years old, nine years old. So, and then I always said to myself, oh, I'd like to try like something. I did like bits and pieces, like local hills, like Tinto and stuff like that, but never anything like massive. And if you know anything about Tinto, it is a, a bit of a challenge itself. Yeah, I've done Tinto. Um, but we've uh, so I just decided I'd, that I'd like to try them out. And I spoke to Kaylee's dad, um, and he took me up a couple of them. Uh, he took me up Tinto a, a few times, and it built up my stamina. And then I just decided, you know what, I'm going to go and try a few of my own. Did the McGoin, the Campsy Hills, uh, we did uh, Conic, and then stupidly, stupidly, because there'll be hill walkers out there who'll be saying, you're an idiot for doing that, did Ben Lomond on my own for my first Munro, which was absolutely terrifying. And uh, I decided to do it on an old firm day, so I know it'll be quite quiet. Um, and uh, getting up, it was absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Good three hours or so, uh, but coming down was hell. Absolutely hell. Uh, so, I think uh, it's definitely something that I'm going to be work- working towards. But just with lockdown, it's difficult to get back out and, and enjoy it. But uh, it's definitely on the horizon. Mm-hmm. Well, since you did mention the old firm, why you are, you're a Rangers fan. One of yes. the few Rangers fans that I really enjoy spending time with. <laughs> but, um, one of so, the few. So, how happy were you? That you got the fifty-five. I was happy. I was. I was. I was ecstatic. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, as, as anyone would be, but um, I'm just in it for the football. That's me. I've, I've always been just in it for the football. Don't like the politics. Don't like the, the, any extra stuff. No, definitely um, not. And I think that. Um, sorry to say, but Rangers were the better team this year. No, not um, at all. I completely agree with you. Rangers were the better team. You don't go a season while unbeaten in the league for nothing. Mm-hmm. That. So, but I'm not one of the cynical Celtic fans. Well, as I always say, I'm a ginger left-handed Protestant that supports Celtic with <laughs> mental health issues. So it's very likely that something really, really went wrong in my childhood that I've not discovered in counselling yet. <laughs> We're trying to distance the Protestant Catholic thing, but yes, it always, always creeps back up. Yeah, but it's one of the things that you, well, if you can have a laugh about it, it's fine. And you have to admit, Rangers were a better team, played us off the park every time. Mm-hmm. Well, the closest rivals to you were St Johnston. 
Yep. Who right. probably statistically did better than us this year. But. Well, <laughs> in terms of cups, yes, but in terms of consistency throughout mm-hmm. what Rangers were, the better team. Have, yeah. to, have to give them their juice. I think they, they set themselves a target and they achieved that target. I think that was kind Definitely. of what they were going for. Steven um, Gerrard has been a revelation. Yeah. But Some just, of the signings that he's made has been, well, maybe they've not played what, what's in minutes, but they're collectively in for the same cause. They're in for the team. And that's that's what Celtic had. Mm-hmm. And now it's became an absolute cluster F of a nightmare. <laughs> which we've rolled the, the nine years of banter years into one superbly humongous embarrassment. Mm-hmm. But, but I have to say... It's going to give them something to work towards. Um, and we'll just we'll see what happens next year. Definitely. Yeah. But it has given me plenty of ammunition for one of my next ones, which will be a starting loving and manager of the worst Celtic <laughs> team in history. Possibly this year. No, no, definitely not. But, um, but remember, I, I lived in the 90s. There's still, there's still stuff to come from there. Um, but, so, I'm, I'm more interested in what's happening in the Euro. Scotland are finally getting a chance I to, know, to what, compete next what, week. Because how old were you when uh, World Cup 98? Five. You were five. five. Well, I, was, I don't remember 98. Yeah, yeah, I was ten. <laughs> I was ten, so I have vague recollections. Mm-hmm. Funny story about it before we dive in. I swear this will be the last one. I've said that three times, but <laughs> third time's a charm. That's it. Uh, I was doing a performance for uh, it was a, it was for a fundraiser, and it was at the Hilton in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. And our uh, remit was we had to pretend that we'd come from a wedding and that we were absolutely hammered. Right. Well, and we would go around and we would banter with the guests and maybe wind them up a little and just have a bit of fun in between yep. these uh, different shows that were going on so it was my first experience of vignettes as right. they were called mm-hmm. so I'm going around pretending I'm drunk and I see this table a lot of people and I thought that guy looks like John Collins I have the perfect opportunity to absolutely rip into this guy <laughs> so I walked up to him and I was going like I was like oh you're you're your goal in 98 against Brazil, mm, beautiful, but why couldn't you hold on to keep the, you know what, to let us get the win? And I was like, can you, can you sign this for me? Can you sign this for me? And I what, just gave him a bit of paper and he signed it and I went, oh great, that'll go on eBay tomorrow. Well, thank you, enjoy the rest of your night. Off I went. So later on in my working career, I was working for um, social work mm-hmm. and I was actually working with John Collins' sister. Right. And this was when he was assistant manager at Celtic at the time with Ronnie Dial. Yep. So I was talking uh, away and like, asking about you know, John Collins, like you know, what it was like, because it was it was interesting to me. And I told him the story like, about the John Collins look like. So she asked me what like, um, when it was, like, and I said it was a couple of years ago by this point. What like, and said, was it at the Hilton in Glasgow? <laughs> Yes. Mm-hmm. It was really John Collins. <laughs> I really got his signature. And I really, really chucked it in the bin. Oh, God. Because I thought it wasn't John Collins. But I was more thinking, is he going to find where I live and kick the utter hell out of me for probably ripping into him? He probably got to quit a lot. No, he, he said it. He said it was. It was very funny. What any? What he did. He did enjoy it. <laughs> but at the same time, he did say to them, "What was that wee ginger prick thinking?" <laughs> exact words. <laughs> <laughs> then when they found out it was part of vignettes and we were all acting, like he, he took it a bit better. But at the point, he was a bit. Was the same that. Yeah, <laughs> just a little. Yeah. So. <laughs> And on that note, we'll now jump into the topic of today's discussion, which are the top five 21st century metal bands. Excellent. Now, I'm excited for this one. I'm very excited for this one. Like, just looking into like some of the facts and figures of these bands was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Well, for my own list, well, they could be formed or founded in the 20th century, so same 90s. But if they achieved prominent success or achieved a relatively strong popularity in the 21st century, or the first album came out in the 20th century, then they would count. Okay. So, being the guest, Jack, I would like you to go first and give me your no worries. first band. Just, my rules were slightly different. Oh, enlightened. Um, so my rules were just that 
the band could be formed in the 20th century, but their first album had to be released in the 21st century. But I think that's quite good because it means that we might mix it up a little bit because we have quite similar taste to music. We'll probably just end up picking the same band. So yes. If there are any that. that do link, then I, I will also say it and we'll go into our rationales behind it good. together. Do you want to do honourable mentions first? Yes, we shall do honourable mentions. Good stuff. And the first one that I want to mention, which is a very recent one, and a band that recently came to our attention in the Eurovision 2021 Song Contest was Blind Channel. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember watching Germany's entry before that, thinking that humanity had died. With the fingers. The finger yes, suit. Yes, the yeah. infamous finger suit. Well, I thought that life was over. I mm -hmm. thought Alison had spiked my drink. <laughs> I thought that the world as I knew it had gone and I might as well go to Mars without oxygen. And then Blind Channel came on with Dark Side and they were a revelation. I was actually surprised at how well they, they did in the, the points with Eurovision yeah. as well. Yes, they finished six. Yeah. Six in the song contest. And it reminded me so much of what I grew up with in my teenage years, the new metal, rock and rap kind of style. Mm -hmm. now, I did a wee bit of research into Blind Channel and they're technically classed as violent pop. Violent pop? Which is quite interesting. That's but, probably um, a, Euro a Eurovision term. Yeah. I think, I think so. that's probably how they qualify for the Eurovision mm -hmm. Song Contest. Mm -hmm. But um, they've had three albums. They released the fourth one coming out this year with Dark Side on it. And as I said before, they remind me of New Metal with their two vocalists, Slat. And they've actually got some great covers Slat, that I've checked out. Um, they've got a cover of Linkin Park's Numb as a tribute to Chester Bennington. Bro, I mean, well, I've not even heard that. Which was fantastic. Uh, they've done a cover of Macklemore's Can't Hold Us. Good. Slat, and their favourite, in my opinion, is Left Outside Alone by Anastasia. All right, okay. It's very good, especially when it starts with a nice, slow kind of lap feel and the nice singing, and then it just bursts into a hardcore scream and everything just kicks off. And the lead singer, uh, Joe Hawken, what has actually done his own cover of Diamonds by Rihanna what, as a solo artist. And I have to say, even though it's not as heavy as Blind Channel, it is very good and worth a mention. Uh, any honourable mentions that you would like to give before I've got we jump quite back? A, I've got a quite few honourable mentions. Yeah. Um, just just purely because if I don't mention them, um, I'll probably get stick for it. So, mm. um, my first honourable mention, again, for me, would be Avenged Sevenfold. Yes. Um, I think they. I don't think they're quite top five for me, but they're definitely worth, you know, recognition for everything really? they've done and they're, they're massive and they've headlined download a couple of times and mm. um, they've got a really good uh, good following a good album track record mm -hmm. um, and decent history to them so I would definitely think Avenged Sevenfold um, would be a, a good honourable mention another one I've got is Disturbed oh are, you, are they might be on your top five maybe spoiler alert maybe, spoiler alert right maybe. okay maybe we'll, we'll see how this unfolds that's fine we'll come to that later it's on it's a good honourable mention no yeah, I I don't, I'll not say too much about Disturbed because I want Andy to kick in with them later on mm -hmm. uh, my next one would be Gojira mm -hmm. right okay who have just released a new record uh, Gojira are French they are um, environmentally conscious so a lot of their music has themes of you know climate change and you know that the humanity is polluting itself, and mm. another, just another epic one. And the last honourable mention I've got for you, um, and just and if I don't mention them, you know, people will come to my house with sticks and try and beat me up. <laughs> um, is Mastodon, who are um, very obscure, but they've got some amount of following, mm. and um, you know, just really classic albums, and they're just getting to that kind of legendary status now, which mm. is really cool. Yeah. So that's that's my honourable mentions for now. Nice. Yeah. My main honourable mention had to be Blind Channel because they just arrived on the scene. Mm -hmm. The main ones that I'll do honourable mentions for very quickly, System Up and Down, Corn, mm -hmm. yep. Limp Biscuit for me for the new metal scene, that was my first kind of introduction to it. I know a lot of people think it sounds like brain cancer, but at the same time, well, I did enjoy it. But some results did fail. Um, <laughs> So they were, they were definitely honourable mentions Good stuff. For, what, for me, off the top of my head. I mean, you have ones like, you know, yourself, like Machine Head. And yeah. What, and ones that were formed in later years. Mm -hmm. what, 
well, the years previous, like our Metallicas, our Iron Maidens, our Guns N' Roses, yeah, well, all well, our Megadeth. So all the ones that paved the way for what we've got now, but we fall out of our arena the only our reason, categories. The only reason I didn't include Machine Head was because that a lot of their kind of early stuff was early nineties, so I was like, mm. I'm trying to avoid as much mm. of Machine Head. But I will just to shout out to Machine Head. The greatest metal album of the 21st century is the Blackening. End, end of conversation for me. Yeah, there's Ooh. like for for them, that is like the black album of the 2000s era. 100 mm. percent for very, me anyway. A very a very good choice, I have to admit. Mm-hmm. So let's start with your first band. Mr. So Reed. my number five um, on my list. Now, I don't I don't actually think these are in any particular order. I think my number one still is my number one, but just these mm. guys could they could go anywhere. Yeah, they're not um, in particular orders for yeah. any of us. Um, my number five choice would be. Trivium. Ah, I've actually seen Trivium mm-hmm. as well. I saw them uh, supporting Kill Switch Engage. Brilliant. But one thing that I didn't necessarily like about them was that they were very wooden. When did you go see Trivium? This was um, 2010s. Right. Like, so it was when Jesse Leach had just returned to Kill Switch Engage. Okay, I'm trying to think. This might be wrong, but I think this was the kind of post Shogun era for Trivium. It was um, when you had before in, in, before in waves. waves. It was in waves, right? In okay, waves. so in waves. Yeah. This was in waves because I know beforehand, yeah, like, they were very energetic and passionate. I'd heard stories about them spitting beer into the crowd and all yeah. that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, but I think when he shaved his head and got his, got the nice hairstyle was when it all kind of heightened up. Yeah. Because they were they were fantastic. I'm mm-hmm. not going to lie, they were fantastic. I love Trivin. Trivin mm-hmm. are a great band. Like, Pull Heart and Strings Here Mark are one of my favourite tracks of all time. Yeah. But it was just when they were playing, it was very wooden. And I didn't understand why, because I'd heard so many different stories about them and how yeah. their stage presence was fantastic. I think with Trivium, for me, they're a very... Their career, if you look back, because I think their, their first album was 2003, so mm. if you look back to um, from when they started 2003, they've had a bit of a roller coaster ride. Mm. There's been a lot of ups, there's been a lot of downs, and and not in terms of like what's been going on with the band, but just musically. Um, they started off with Ember to Inferno, which was received okay. They were mm. a, a lot younger, and there could have been a lot more done with the album. It was okay, um, but... Definitely 2005's Ascendancy Yes It set the standard for Trivium's music moving forward And it was just It was like Gold Dust um, Ascendancy is just A, a superb Trivium album And, and still my favourite to this day mm. But then they went a bit Downhill The Crusade Which is probably one of their worst received albums mm. um, And then back up for Shogun The Shogun supporters out there Absolutely love it mm. um, And then he did in waves, but he blew his voice. So the the, the thing about the, sc- the screaming had to completely stop, um, and um, he had to retrain his voice. And Winston McCall from Parkway Drive, who we might get onto later on, um, actually had to discuss it with him to help him retrain. You mm. know, a bit of Matt Heafy's vocals from Trivium. So um, there's there's been a lot of kind of you know differences in his musical style because. More more often than not now, he's doing less screaming and more kind of vocal stuff and actual singing. Mm. Um, and uh, kind of putting the screaming in the back burner or relying on backup singers like Corey in the band to, to do the mm. screaming side. And when you see them live, now it's Corey that does all the screaming, Matt just does the, the actual singing mm. in Trivium. Um, what I will say about Trivium is that, and, and just more or less just talking about Corey and Matt in particular, as guitar players they are some of the best guitar players working in the industry today mm. they just, they, these, you can tell that they're the kids that in the 90s grew up and spent every single day just playing guitar until yeah. they've mastered it, so and you can really hear that and when you see them live you just see them you know, you know, picking away and like they're picking notes out the air, just phenomenal musicians um, but it's just that overall um, I, I wouldn't say that every album has been a massive hit. Mm. I think I can always take some really good parts from the poorer albums that they've got. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they hit a hit a high, like Ascendancy, Shogun, um, what was the the most recent one? Sin in the Sentence. What the Dead Men Say came out after that, slightly slightly good, but Sin in the Sentence was just it mm. came out of nowhere and it was just banger after banger after banger mm-hmm. after banger. 
they've got a good mix of heavy and, and clean stuff as well. Um, I do sometimes think they get a bad rap, you know, so a lot of, there's a lot of, not Trivium haters, but people that say, oh, they're okay, but I think they've, they've, they're definitely better than that, better than that in my eyes. Anyway. I do enjoy Trivium, mm -hmm. like, and like, their vocalist is fantastic. I remember when they done um, Roadrunner United. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and I think that was when I really heard him properly sing. Yep. And was like, this guy has some range, he's got some chops here. Like, and the work they've done, specifically at Roadrunner United, was really good. And it gave me more of an appreciation for Trivium mm -hmm. like, when I got more of their albums. I mean, the Crusade, I got that in the pound shop, so that tells you everything about that one. But, but when I got in waves, it was like a, it was like a rebirth mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. But, and it made me appreciate them a lot more. And they definitely evolved a lot. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like that they've kept the core of their style, but they have experimented slightly as they've went on. But that's one of the things, as you know, for a good artist is being willing to try different things. If it doesn't work, then mm -hmm. at least they can say they tried. But Trivium definitely, definitely agree. That should definitely be. worth on the top five for me anyway. Yes. So, there you go. so that'll jump to me. Yep. Go and I am going to go with one of the, uh, well, the only band I've got in here which actually formed in the 2000s. Right. And that is Five Finger Death Punch. Okay, yeah. Uh, they were formed in 2005. They're officially classed as American Heavy Metal. Mm -hmm. They have eight studio albums, the yep. first of which was released in 2007. They have four certified platinum and gold albums and they were considered the most successful artists of the decade. Mm. And one of the things I really love in particular, being more inclined of singing, I always look at the singers themselves and how they conduct themselves with their stage presence, how good their voice is, if they're able to switch from scream mode to sick to vocals. Well, and Ivan Moody is very, very underrated as a singer mm -hmm. because he really does have that power and that passion that you want from a singer. He's got a very good vocal yes. range. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And everybody seems to like, diss them because they're from Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm -hmm. So they think they're more of a glamour metal band. Yeah. But they're consistent, like they're consistently bringing out good album after good album after good album. And one of the things I liked about their recent album, F8, was that they were they started experimenting with their style. Mm -hmm. So one of the tracks I really like is uh, a little bit off. Okay. And it's basically 2020's anthem where he's just singing about how he feels off and he doesn't know why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I could sum up everybody in 2020. Oh yeah. But, but it had more of a just an acoustic track kind of feel to it. Yep. He's also done um, on the album Blue on Black, which had a country metal style. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really, really smart. Like, they can weave in these certain elements of different genres like, into their overall sound. And yep. it still turns out really well. The only thing that I will say that, I'm, that I think bots them a little is their covers. Mm. They've done a cover of Bad Company, which was fantastic and recently done a cover of Gone Away by The Offspring, which, yep. which is good. But they've only done, I think, four covers and two. They've got House of the Rising Sun as well, yeah. that's a five kind of Yes, they have indeed. That's the one that I'm not too yeah. chuffed on. Mm -hmm. and I, don't I think know it, what you mean. I don't think it's as good, but, it's the, but when I look at covers, like, I can maybe get away with one or two if there's a good collection of covers, but mm -hmm. if there's only like four and two of them, I'm like, eh. It's still a 50% pass rate and out of eight studio albums there should really be a higher pass rate for that but it doesn't take away from the fact that for me Five Finger Death Punch like, are one of the best recent bands like, in my time especially their, um, their double bass drum solos mm -hmm. are, like, are fantastic they are actually I've seen them live um, and their stage shows fantastic and they've mm. got a really um, healthy fan following um, and they've got a lot of hate as well. There's a lot of people in the metal community and the rock community that really don't like them. And I think it's because like, they are from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. well, I think, I people... think that, but they get tarnished with the redneck brush and I don't think that's fair. I don't, I don't think, think that's fair, fair. either. Because like, um, there's, there's nothing wrong. They're very patriotic. They, mm -hmm. love, they love America. They love their country. Yeah. And I don't see anything wrong with that. That's like no. uh, everybody hating on Flower of Scotland. Yeah. But I also think like 
remove it, you remove the politics from it. It's just about the music, and the music's actually yeah, really good. They've got a really good song with Rob Halford um, from Judas Priest. Oh um, yes, lift me up, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. It's and brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And Ivan and, and Ivan Woody and Rob's vocals just work really well together on the record. So mm-hmm. it's it's. Um, yeah, I would say Five Finger Death Punch. They're not on my list, but they're definitely one that I I feature them on the show quite a lot as well, and mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I definitely appreciate them. Yeah, I remember listening to uh, one of the rock radio shows, and it was when they did uh, Rock Espresso. Right. In the mornings, mm-hmm. like to wake, to basically wake you up mm-hmm. with a good kick and riff. So they played Five Finger Death Punch. So, um, again. Uh, the Bleeding. No, yeah. Well, it Probably their off, most it, popular one. Yeah, it starts off quite uh, low and slow, so the guy started kind of ripping it, going, I don't think this is, well, this is putting me back to sleep, mate, and then it just kicks in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I can see it now, but the radio edit cuts the scream. Yeah. And for me, the scream is definitely what wakes you up. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think I think you're right on that, because I remember the first time I ever heard them, it was, in, it was radio I was listening to, and it was the bleeding, and there was two versions of it. There's the radio edit where they just sang, and then there's the actual version with the, the screaming. And the screaming definitely, you know, resonates better because the song's yeah. about, you know, how he's been betrayed and uh, mm-hmm. how, he, how he feels and the screaming just resonates better with his, his emotional side. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people... Uh, but the singing, sorry to interrupt, no. the singing sells records, that's why. It does indeed, mm-hmm. but a lot of people do this scream type of music. Yep. They think that well, they don't realise there's training behind it, like you have to go to vocal coaching and vocal, do vocal warm ups and lessons just like you would with a singer. Yep. And they just think it's, oh, not, it's, it's not easy. They do they just think it's someone screaming down the microphone or anybody can do that. No. But not keeping in with a pitch and a tone that you need to do when you're having to do any type of vocal work. And if you do it not trained effectively, just like Matt Heafy was spoke at Trivium, you can really damage your voice mm-hmm. extremely. Right, so we jump back to you, my friend. Number four. Mm. Now, I'm scared that this might be on your list already, but we'll, we'll, ch- we'll chat about it. Right. Um, because this band, I don't know if you remember, was actually, I mean, I'd heard of them before, but like years ago, you'd actually gifted to me one of their CDs for my birthday. Um, and this band is from Byron Bay in South Wales, Australia. That's Partway Drive. And I've mentioned Winston McCall before. Winston McCall is the vocalist for Partway Drive. Um, and I must say, like I went through a bit of a resurgence with Parkway Drive about three or four years ago, and they were absolutely, they're just phenomenal, they're phenomenal musicians. Um, they've, again, like Trivium, they've evolved a lot since their kind of first records, but I think they've been more successful. Like I can pick out, you know, strong album after strong album after strong album with Parkway Drive. Um, and uh, I've seen them once, once, and it was Download 2018. Oh, very nice. And um, they were on early because they basically Guns N' Roses were playing the main stage. And, you know, as Guns N' Roses are, they like a big audience, so they were kind of making the other bands finish early so that, you know, the crowd could make their way around to Guns N' Roses. Mm. And to be fair to Guns N' Roses, they did play like a three and a half hour set. Um, but Parkway Drive came on about seven o'clock, and I'll never forget it. It was just, I, I took my pal along to see them, and uh, he'd never really listened to them before. I was like, you're going to stand here and you're going to watch these guys because they're going to be incredible. And just Winston McCall alone as a vocalist, mm. the power behind his voice, the lyrics, the themes that they use, um, the musicianship is just absolutely incredible. And actually, I'm going to say it, a lot of part we a lot of early part we drive fans are going to hate me for this one. Reverence, their most recent album, mm. is my favourite part we drive album. Ah. Favourite, but I still have a huge amount of respect for like Horizons and Kill 'Em with a Smile and stuff, all the early stuff. Mm. But just there was something about Reverence that just hit every beat for me, and mm. um, the themes of the record, the stuff he sings about, you know, I can relate to. Yeah. Um, and it was just, I think it was one of my favourites of the year, actually, the year it came out. Um, they were part of that little resurgence, where, along with Dexit like Crazy Piss and Alexis on Fire. Yes. That kind of, like, um, kind of hardcore, scream sing, yep. like, very intense, very fast-paced. Mm-hmm. Like, that always really loved their energy. Yep. Like, you could just tell that they, were, they could go out, they, that they would go in a studio, maybe even do it in one take and just go... 
There we awesome. go. That's it done. done. Yeah. And it's a bunch, and we were talking to the Beach Boys earlier. These are the surfing dudes of, uh, you know, <laughs> the west coast of Australia. And you don't actually think, oh, this guy's singing about how much he hates God. And, you know, and screaming down a microphone. And you think, oh, this, you know, don't really put two and two together. So, yeah. Um, but no, for me, they were just live, amazing, and in the studio, brilliant as well. And um, it's one that I find myself going back to more and more and more and more and more. So, yeah, hundred percent. Definitely, ha- half to agree with that. Mm-hmm. Parkway Drive are fantastic. Yeah, they, they really are. Sadly, I've not seen them live. There's a lot of bands that I haven't seen live, but I do appreciate the music and the style. Mm-hmm. Obviously, well, yeah. because obviously I've got a very eclectic taste in music. If you put my MP3 player on the shuffle, you could hear Keen and Johnny Cash <laughs> one minute, and then yep. you'd hear. Guns N' Roses and pro- actually my next entry which is Kill Switch Engage ah right now this might tie in quite nicely because this is one of mine later on as well oh uh, good but good, we'll, talk, good. we'll talk about Kill Switch let's talk about them now. definitely so formed in 1999 mm-hmm. like, um, they've had two singers over the course of their very long career like yep. Jesse Leach and Howard Jones mm-hmm. like, they are classed as metal core bands like, they had eight studio albums their first released in 2000 and they have been described by several outlets as one of the leading forces of the metalcore genre. I would actually go as far to say that Killswitch and Cage are the definitive metalcore band. I think if you didn't have Killswitch and Cage, you would have bands that come after it, like for example, All That Remains. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, which are kind of, I always say they're Killswitch light. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, because a couple of songs that they've done were very kind of ballady. Yeah. I think but at the same time, like, I do love all of them. Yeah. I think I think they're brilliant. But Kill Switch and Gage. I said the Guns N' Roses were my favourite, like, um, kind of past era band of all time. Mm-hmm. Kill Switch and Gage are my favourite current era band of right. all time. Yeah. Like, there's always a debate of who's better, Howard Jones or Jesse Leach. And I just say, why did it's like the Messi Ronaldo debate? Like, enjoy them both yeah. while you have them. I was just about to say I don't care. Like I like both of them. I mean, I think for me, I, I grew up listening to the Howard Jones era, but then when he left and Jesse Leach came back, it was like you know discovering a, a whole new band again. So it was, uh, um, I think you know take them both. And on the most recent record, we have got a song with the signal features fire. both, which was epic. I have to say, um, when I heard that song. I came. <laughs> wow. Well, I hadn't had sex in a long time. And wow. That was, that, was the, that was the best feeling I've had in my whole life. You're going to have to click that button. Not for kids. Anymore. Definitely not for kids. No, definitely not. Um, um, but yeah, that's, wow. how, that's how powerful that it was. <laughs> this was something like I'd followed Kill Switch and Gage from the very beginning. Yep. From the very beginning. Jesse Leach, he brought the raw, the emotion, the intensity, the passion. Like, I always loved My Last Serenade just for the fact that it was, he was able to switch between vocals so elegantly. Yeah. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Well, when I was in the band in my past lives, we did a cover of Kill Switch and it took two of us to do it. Mm-hmm. One to devote to screaming, me to devote to singing. Yeah. Because we couldn't not do it without getting the justification. Mm-hmm. But well, Howard Jones has got the both. Bit, yeah. the both. So is Jesse Leach as well. Yeah, well, they both they both definitely have it. Like Howard Jones's era brought more of what like, you're you're harmonising. Mm-hmm. Like you're, he was really in tune with his vocals. He gave the the band a new dimension and yep. helped expand it to a wider audience. They were on the end part. It was on the Resident Evil soundtrack, I believe. I think it was. Yeah. Like, and like, there was always. a the debate of did you prefer the studio edit without the screaming or did you prefer the, the album edit and it was once again I love both mm. but, but mm-hmm. that's quite strange because I'm pretty sure that soundtrack the Resident Evil soundtrack had um, a Cradle of Filth on it as well who if you know Cradle of Filth they yes. don't do sing. they don't do singing yes they don't do that uh, even though I write one of my favourite Cradle of Filth tracks is Nymphetamine which yes. has a has beautiful vocals on it it does but it's also got as well definitely <laughs> definitely it's fun, well, they're fantastic and then so, well, sadly Howard had to leave because of his, um, his diabetes yep. and I'm not sure what was going on there and Jesse came back and I was a bit hesitant at first thinking, how is this going to go? Because it's established this new sound. Mm-hmm. 
what, and it became more broader appeal. But then when he came back, it was just like picking up from 1990, yeah. again. Oh my god, I was so really? happy when I heard "All in Due Time." I was obsessed with that song. Yeah, and the song always. Mm. It's heart wrenching for me. But the video is the video is well. I remember watching that, crying, people watching that video. Going, I shouldn't. That, this is the way music should make you feel. Mm -hmm. Feel a roller coaster of emotions every I think single time. You're definitely hitting the nail on the head with that one. Kills which engage have just they've got the emotional impact with them, and um, they've got a good balance of you know the softer parts and then the heavier bits as well. Have you ever seen them? Yes, I've seen them. They're, they're one of the bands that I. Uh, I don't like to go to see bands more than once. Mm -hmm. I like to have that singular experience to really mull over and digest and go, wow, this was amazing. Yeah. So I've only seen two bands twice in my entire life. Okay. First one's Nickelback, don't judge me. No judgment. Well, um, no judgment yet. It's Alison and I's um, favourite band. It was the first band that we both really liked and Far Away was our first dance at our wedding. Right. Well, so there's an emotional connection there. Mm -hmm. So I'd saw... Uh, Nickelback because the, uh, the first time when they supported Bon Jovi at Hampton Park. Right. Because I took my parents to see Bon Jovi. Okay. And then went to see Nickelback when I started going with my now wife. Mm hmm. So, so they're twice. And Kill Switch and Gage were well, twice as well because it had a good justification because I wanted to see both singers in action. I right. saw Howard mm -hmm. and I wanted to go and see Jesse. And that was the same tour that Trevor won Sport Act. Right. I'm jealous. I'm really jealous because. Um... I've never seen Howard, but I would have loved to have seen Howard. A lot of people talk about, if they could go back in time and see one singer, they're like, oh, Freddie Mercury, like 100%, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting, no, do you know what? Howard Jones, at the height of Killswitch and Gage era, well, in about, 2006. Have you heard Light the Torch? I have, yes, and I've, I, he's in another band as well. Uh, is mm -hmm. it Scion? I might be getting that wrong. I think so. Um, uh, um, so as far as I know, Light the Torch are doing a going to be doing a tour with Killswitch Engage. Fantastic. So that could be one where I potentially break my rule and go see Killswitch for a third time just to see Light the Torch with them. They are touring. For, for the hope mm -hmm. that they do the Signal Fire live. Oh, that would be incredible. Well, yeah. If they do that, well, Alice and me have to divorce me because I would feel like I'm committing adultery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they, well, I've, I've seen Killswitch three times. Um, I've seen them twice support Maiden. Uh, the first time was in Newcastle, and the second time was in Aberdeen. Um, and uh, the funny thing about uh, uh, if you've ever go and see Iron Maiden, right? I'm one of them, but there are Iron Maiden fans, and they only want to see one band, and that's Iron Maiden, right? Yes. And I really don't feel like the support bands that go and that, that go on tour with Iron Maiden get the credit that they deserve. But for me, I was up the front anyway because I thought I'm going up the front for Maiden, and I'm also going to see Kill Switch Engage. And I, they were all making eye contact with me because I was the only one that was like going for it and like singing their songs. They're like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And I'm like, yeah. And all these Maiden fans are like, yeah, but it's not Bruce Dickinson, is it? And I'm like, oh, calm down. Um, yeah. And then the third time I went to see them was um, uh, at the Barrowlands last, two years ago, when they played, they did the um, Atonement tour. Yes. And they did play Signal Fire. And we were all silently hoping that Howard Jones would just show oh. up. But unfortunately it didn't happen. Um, but he did actually show up at the show in London. Oh, he did. man. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's on YouTube, so you can watch that one there. Oh, definitely. Really definitely. But, uh, oh, I'd definitely go and see them if, if uh, Howard Jones is even in the building. Yes, 100%. definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. So we jump back to you, my friend. Yes, so that, so that was my number two. So kill right. switch engages my number two. So I'm going to jump to my number three. Okay. Um, and then we'll just bypass my number two because I feel like we've covered kill switch engage. Okay. Um, so my number three is a heavy controversial choice. Ooh, I love controversy. Right. They are, and you probably worked out who they are already. They're one of my all-time favourites. They're very, 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 very different. Mm. Um, half the metal community fucking hate them. <laughs> <laughs> and half the metal community fucking love them, right? right. It's a very controversial choice. Right, let's see which side I fall in. My number three choice is Ghost. Oh. Okay, it's Ghost, right? Um, and Ghost are a band from Sweden um, who are the mastermind project of this man called Tobias Forge, right? And he's kind of in charge of everything that goes on um, with Ghost. So he writes everything, 
He's the singer for the band. He does the guitar tracks, the drums, the bass, um, and he like hires musicians to come in to fill in for them. The, the, the way they get around this live is that they've got this theme, and the theme is that they're like this satanic church. Right. Um. So the lead singer is basically like the antichrist version of the Pope. <laughs> Right, and he wears black and white face makeup, and he wears like the Pope outfit, and he's called Papa Emeritus, right? Oh my goodness! And Papa Emeritus is—he's um, had four incarnations because every album he dies, and then there's the next one. So the first album was Papa Emeritus the first, second album was Papa Emeritus the second, third album was Papa Emeritus the third, and then for the fourth al- album they had the Cardinal that came in. Um, and then eventually, the very final gig of the tour, he became Papa Emeritus the Fourth. So we don't know what's going to happen with the fifth album. Um, they've got this whole theme going on where everyone that plays in the band wears like masks, so you don't really see their identity and stuff. All right. Um, and they've got like this really interesting backstory that they've made up for themselves about how they've, you know, they're the, the Antichrist Church that goes behind everything. Um, See, that's what I like. I like it's about theatre. Yes. Theater. Yeah. That, that also reminds me of a band, uh, a Scottish band, Glory Hammer. Glory, I've heard of Glory Hammer. Well, they're very them. similar. Where they'll have um, have like this kind of grandiose theme in it, plays mm-hmm. in there, like a theatre kind of style. Yeah. Well, where they have like Angus McFife, the the master warrior. Yeah. All this kind of stuff, and it's it's, it's really it's really good. So it's kind of, it's kind of similar to that. In the yeah. Where you're it theatrical. happens. It happens back to the days of you know like Guar and Lordy and stuff yes. like that. You know, like they've got this backstory where they're aliens from outer space, and, but it's just musicians. Yeah. But the thing is. They're, they're really not, they're not, I mean, they were voted, controversially, the best metal band of the 2010s era. Right. Um, but it's because they're so, they are very popular. Um, to put it into perspective, my dad, who doesn't like metal music, loves Ghost. Like, ah. He does really like Ghost. They are heavy, they've got some heavier stuff. Metallica love them. Metallica have taken them on tour with them. I've, I've, I've seen Ghost support Metallica when I went to Slane Castle to see them. Um, and I've seen Ghost three times, with the Papa Emeritus, right, the third edition, and then the Cardinal twice. Um, but they've got four studio albums. The first album came out in 2010, um, and all the way up to 2018, and they're in the studio just now working on their fifth record. Um, but they're not what you expect. Like, you look at them and you think, these guys are like black metal, like heavy, you know, behemoth style stuff. Yeah. And they come out and it's kind of a mix of, you know, kind of classic rock with like heavier elements in it. Mm. And I've heard people refer to them as, uh, you know, heavy metal Scooby-Doo. But they're, <laughs> they're, they're so much better than that. And, and they didn't really help themselves when they came out with their fourth record and had a saxophone solo in it. But I think that's kind of... Ghost way of saying fuck you to the they kind of to metal sax community. Solo. <laughs> hey, so, have you ever watched Father Ted and they say we have to lose the sax solo? They didn't. Need to lose no, they the didn't sax need to lose solo. the sax solo. It was epic. But Ghost are one of my all-time favourites of the kind of recent era, and um, they're just um, so good live. They did a holy, an unholy communion with us, <laughs> um, and they get a lot of their you know, fans to dress up like nuns and stuff. So they're, they're quite anti-religious, but they, you know, they just throw that in. It's a bit of theatre. And yeah. I just think they're fantastic. If you've not listened to Ghost, go and listen to Ghost. You're either going to love them or you're going to hate them. They're a bit marmite Yeah, the so. marmite of the metal community. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we'll go from <laughs> marmite to something that, a band that I don't think I've heard anybody say that they don't like. Okay. But even... I think what, I might know who this is. Even uncult. Uh, uncultured swines of the metal community well let's say oh I've heard of them oh I like them and it ties in quite well because you're talking about masks oh so, I know exactly who we're going to talk about yes, now yes mm-hmm. it's got to be the one the only Slipknot of course it is yes now, Slipknot I was torn about putting this on because as I had stated that um, as long as the first album had came out in 2000 mm-hmm that they would have clarified, but after doing some digging, their first al- self-titled album was released in 1999. Yeah. But they went on tour at the start of the 2000s. Well, this is why they're not on my list, because I would have put them on my list, but I thought, no, I, I, my rules were slightly different. Mm. Uh, when they, uh, they came into real, even though they were well-known in 1999 with their first album and developed a very good following, 
it was when they brought out Iowa, mm. which was in the 2000s, yep. that they exploded onto the scene. So they were formed in 1995. Well, they're still classed as heavy metal. They have six studio albums. Uh, infamously known for knocking Ed Sheeran off the top spot. Thank you. What? Excellent. 30, 30 million album sales worldwide. What? Well, 2001, like I said, was when they rose to dominance with Iowa. Mm-hmm. And it brought us the one and only talented person of our time, Corey Taylor. Yeah. I mean, I look at Corey Taylor and think, like, he has done Slipknot, he's done Stone Sour, he's done his own uh, self titled work. He's done an acoustic version of the SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. Mm-hmm. He's also done <laughs> his own Christmas song. He did, yes, I've with, had it on the show at Christmas. Yes, time. it's yeah. absolutely amazing, one of my favourites. Mm-hmm. Sums up Christmas for me. Yeah, it sums up Christmas for a lot of people. And the <laughs> irony is, not Corey Taylor, he loves Christmas. Yeah. Well, he just heard so many people talking it like that about Christmas and thought, I can make a song here. Mm-hmm. And I just love at the end when he goes, Hi, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I just could not help but just laugh at my, that. It was, it was fantastic. My favourite line in that song is, I ain't no commie nut or nothing. Yes. Because it just fits in well with the American stereotype, doesn't it? Definitely does. <laughs> Definitely does. And he was one, uh, somewhere to travel, where his voice started to blow out from screaming mm-hmm. and had to get retrained. Yep. Uh, and especially when he went to Stone Sour, where he was more singing than then screaming and then when they brought out House of Golden Bones mm. well, the screaming came back and it definitely sounded a lot better. Corey Taylor's got a very unique screaming style as well like I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily describe Corey's voice as screaming I would say it's more like a growly thing because he it's like he's it's like spoken words yes. with this kind of like you know really growly stuff in the background and you just want to start punching stuff along to it you know definitely um but Definitely. I remember when Slipknot came to province and everybody was thinking, oh, it's the rise of satanic culture and people are going to their gigs to slash each other in the back and worship Satan. And I even remember going to buy uh, a Rob Zombie album when I first started getting back into uh, my metalish roots at about 13 or 14. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying, I won't turn into a Slipknot, will I? <laughs> Not buying this album, but I can see. I can see by like looking at them, you get that vibe. But, yeah. Like, I'm gonna be really honest with everyone right now. This whole stereotype about people that like metal music, we're all just a bunch of nerds. We're all just a bunch of geeks. Definitely. Like, we're not. We're not like going about killing folk. You know, I can't speak so much for the black metal community. When I say black metal, I mean you know yeah, we're the talking, heavier Norwegian yes. black stuff, black metal stuff. Yes. Um, but you know the the general metal community, we're all just geeks. We love Star Wars and Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. And that's mm. it. We love, we love a lot of things. But fear, what fear is not, we are the kind, simple people. Of course. Yeah. Who like to rock out to the most intense music because sometimes that's the only way we can express our feelings. That's why when you go to a metal show, there's not much police presence as there is when you go to see, take that. Yeah, or Oasis. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like back in back in the day, that shows my age. <sighs> uh, yeah, Slipknot. What well, for me? They had to be on the list. Oh, they kind of need to be. Well, I think as well. Just one last point about Crow Taylor. He's one of two vocalists that I think would be on the Mount Rushmore of twenty first century metal. And we'll get to the second one later on. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, a Slipknot, fantastic, excellent musicians. Really good live show, um, you know, absolute fantastic record after fantastic record. I don't think, I, I think, you know, you could say they've got weaker albums, but I don't think they've got a bad album. No, they definitely, definitely got a bad album. Um, and, you know, I feel like the most recent one, We Are Not Your Kind, mm-hmm. really harpens back. It's a good hybrid of the early kind of heavy stuff and also the, you know, the kind of more modern feel that Slipknot have got to them, so... It shows their evolution. Mm-hmm. It shows mm-hmm. that, that they've taken the good parts of their past, learned from the mistakes and embraced the future with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and it was just, it was fantastic. Yeah, was loved it. Brilliant. And the fact, like I said, that it knocked Ed Sheeran off the top of the charts was yep. fantastic. It was I loved it. Second so, favourite album that year. It's the only time that I've willingly not supported a ginger. <laughs> Corey Taylor, do you have a ginger? Slight tinge. Slight, slight tinge. tinge. Slight tinge. Right, so we jump back to you, my friend. Well, my number two was Killswitch Engage. 
And we've spoken about kill switch engage, so okay. we'll go to your number two. Ah. Yeah. Right, now here's a, here's another controversial one. Okay. And mostly because of the status of their genre. Hmm. Right, so this band were formed in 1996 and started out as new metal, and that's why I include them in this list. Ah. But they are officially known as American Rock. Right. And that band is Linkin Park. Okay, yes, of course. What? And they were... Very iconic. Very iconic. Mm-hmm. What? And obviously the tragic passing of Chester Bennington in 2017 yeah. caused the band to go into a hiatus. But thankfully, they are working on some new music. Good, excellent. I'm not sure how that will work if they will bring someone else in. I'm really hoping that they don't because make sure you know that Lutz vocals have gotten fantastically mm-hmm. better since... Well, since their initial incarnation as a new metal band, yeah. seven studio albums voted the third best band of the new millennium, mm-hmm. and their first album, Hybrid Theory, was released in 2000. That makes me feel really old. Mm, same. I remember watching the music channels um, <laughs> and when Hybrid Theory came out and just having, um, it was in in the end, the music, the music video for that was on. Yes. Um, yes. 21 years ago. It's crazy to think about. It's, it's unreal. <laughs> The fact they were formed in 1996 as well. Yeah. Well, that makes you makes you feel. I was primary five, I think. I was uh, well, and you, three years old. Yes. <laughs> so there we go. That makes me feel even older. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember hearing them, and it was like a revelation mm. what, for new music. They were the first band that I saw live. In really? My, in my life. I've never had the pleasure of seeing. Um, yeah. Like in part life, it was during their Meteora tour, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, numb. What? And yeah, their support act was Lost Profits. Ah, we'll not talk about Lost Profits. Yeah, yeah. looking back on it is quite ironic in a sick way because when you find out about Chester Bennington's past and he was, mm. well, he suffered as a child. Yep. So the irony of those two bands being at the same time, one yeah. a perpetrator and one a cause, well, it, it's, a ba- it's a bad sense of symmetry. Yeah. But, that being said, when Linkin Park came on, they blew it it's out of the water. Absolutely. And I think they, it, it shows a test to their you know, their legacy. Not that they're finished, because you say they're working on new material, but you know, a test to the legacy that you, know, you can still listen to albums like Hybrid 3D and think, that could have came out last week. It, you know, it, it, it's it's definitely not ahead of their time, but they were definitely looking forward. And they were one of the few bands mm-hmm. that managed to survive and evolve past the new metal scene. The only yeah. other one that I thought, in my opinion, did that was Papa Roach. Yeah, because mm-hmm. like, they seem to what well, managed to adapt to that time and what well, they're still going strong as well. If well, you could count Slipknot as new metal, I suppose the roots are in new metal. Yeah. They, they kind of evolved yeah. past they were, it. They were, they were in new metal, yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. Well, but when I first heard it, well, and the com- combination of singing, screaming, and rapping, mm-hmm. I was blown away. These, these were three separate genres for me at that point Yeah. that you never thought would combine. Mm-hmm. And not only did they combine, they combined beautifully. Well, the Collision Course album with Jay-Z mm. is an album that I can listen to all the way through without stopping and go, this is fantastic. It's only <laughs> six tracks, they pick the right ones, they merge them together, yep. and it's once again a style that you did not think would work, but did, and it showed you the way they were able to transcend between our, t- our side of the music to the mainstream, mm-hmm. and everybody still loved them. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and just listening to... I know their last album was more of a kind of poppy kind of style, one, one, one more light. Mm-hmm. But the worst part is when you listen to it, there's so many warning signs for what to come to Chester. Yeah. Especially listening to the track One More Light. I actually think what. Um, I, I, I'm going to be careful here with what I say, but the, tra- the tragic you know, circumstances that happened with Chester Bennington and with Chris Cornell as well from, yeah, from Soundgarden, yeah, um, which were very close, I believe. I think they were months yeah. apart. Yeah. yeah, the song One More Light was about... Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think it was months apart. But the, the, the amazing stuff that, as a result, you know, the conversations that people are having um, as a result of these 
this tragedy that's happened mm. has, had a, has a, had a positive effect. And, it definitely has. And I think a lot of the metal fans have looked at this and seen the tragedy, and they, you know they've started admitting to their own kind of you know um, you know issues that their own they're having and, and the help that they can get. So yep. yeah, mm-hmm. what. Try and put a positive spin on it. Well, it is de- it's definitely a positive spin because it shows you not only has why the band left a lasting musical legacy, but they've also left a lasting impact on society as well, yeah. mm-hmm. and especially in the metal community. Absolutely. People that have finally been able to come out and get help, and maybe that means that bands that we thought might peter out, mm-hmm. but as a result of this, then we'll hopefully get more work from them, more yeah. positive work from them as well. Definitely. But Lincoln Park was just what it was mind blowing all the way mm-hmm. at some points I thought when Minutes to Midnight came out I thought no you've sold your soul you look <laughs> like you too but then you listen we're going to gonna the- get a free album on iTunes <laughs> and then you listen to the album and you realise okay it's all good we're alright yeah. uh-huh. everything's okay so I'm, I'm actually interested to hear your number one mm. before mine okay um, uh-uh. but, but unless you want me to go first it's up to you uh-huh. I will I will go first so that okay. way we can have the guests as the grand finale. Fantastic. So my number one, well sadly I've not seen them live. Okay. I really wish that I have because in my eyes, just beautiful, beautiful music. Mm-hmm. And it is a band disturbed. Ah, uh, there we go. For the night. 19- I knew they were coming. Yes. Well, if anybody knows me or has listened to any of these shows mm-hmm. or knows me in any way, shape, or form, they know that I have a hard on over David Raymond voice. Mm. Well, they were formed in 1994, they took a hiatus in 2011, and then came back in 2015. They're officially classed as heavy metal, seven studio albums. The first one, The Sickness, came out in 2000. Now, I was talking about covers with Five Finger Death Punch. Yep. What? I was just about to mention, yeah. Really and cool. these guys are the masters of cover tracks. Some of the ones that they have, Loud, Land of Confusion, Shout, I still mm. haven't found what I'm looking for. And the one that everybody knows now, which seems to propel the stratosphere, yep. Sound of Silence. Absolutely, it was a really epic track. It we did, a, at Ironworks, you know, the show, we did a cover edition where it was all, you know, metal bands that had covered pop songs. And the biggest one was the Disturbed Land of Confusion that we did, just because it had a bit of that kind of Genesis-y feel, but really, it played homage to the Genesis song, but it also um, had a really heavy kind of rhythm to it. And uh, yeah. Is it Donovan, the guitar player? Is that right? Yes. Uh, what a fantastic musician he is. Yeah, they're so... Yeah. What, the entire band is just what revolutionary in their sound. Mm. What, and you think about where they started from because like, they were also very what the new metal type mm-hmm. of sounds mm-hmm. like, especially with tracks like you know Down With The Sickness and Stricken like, and they were they were tired with the same br- uh, brush off they sounded too same yep. and you know, I remember seeing the par- like the parody and it was a, 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 an advert for the greatest hit of the start right. and they played lots, lots of tracks back to back and they did and they sounded the same because mm-hmm. they played Stricken they played Time of the Sickness they played Prayer and they all had that kind of kind of sound that they were known for mm-hmm. and then they took a hiatus and then in 2015 they came back with Immortalised right what? and goodness gracious me especially with the sound of silence mm-hmm. it showed there was a lot more skill than than a lot of people gave them credit for. You've got to love it when a band goes on hiatus because you normally know that they're going to come back with an absolute banger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nine times out of yeah. ten. And then when you thought that maybe it was just going to come back with that album and they were going to go away, right, we did it, we came back, we, we, we're going to we're gonna end on this high. They then released Evolution, mm-hmm. which experiments with their style again. Well, it gives it a more, a couple of hints of techno but keeps to their, their core roots of metal. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it's fantastic. It's one that I cannot skip a single track. Yeah. And no covers. Mm. Which I also liked because it just showed how good they were with mm-hmm. their original songs. Yeah. I mean, the song No More, or Uninvited Guest, one of the bonus tracks, is beautifully written, has the same kind of sound of silence feel with 
a more operatic they can kind of style mm -hmm. uh, uh, hold on to memories it's just the lyrics are so heartbreaking but they also give you hope because it's about like when it's like everybody will pass away eventually but as long as you hold on to the memories and keep them alive and they stay alive with you mm -hmm. uh, it, it can take it can take you to euphoria one minute and then like complete despair the next or, and that's the type of musical journey that you want all, to go that on. all artists want to go mm -hmm. on yeah, definitely. and Disturbed are just they're fantastic I could I could gush about them for another hour but I'm like, pressing for time it would want to <laughs> yeah. um, and I've already gushed about them enough when I talked about <coughs> uh, my albums that I could play and not skip a single track mm -hmm. like in the previous season and Disturbed's Evolution was on it and I just gushed away about them Disturbed are the Oh, well, no, one of two bands that are the only two remaining bands on my bucket list to have never seen. Same. I did have tickets to go see them one time, and well, due to unforeseen circumstances, I wasn't able to go. Mm. It's my biggest regret of my life. Because I think they played the Hydro a couple of years ago with, was it, was it Korn? Yes, that right? I think yeah. that, was, that was part of the Revolution Tour, as yeah. far as I remember. Um, no, definitely need to. Maybe we could go together and go and see Disturbed together. I would like that. That would be excellent. I think I think that would be good. That could be a live special. Yeah, oh, definitely. We're um, here live at the... <laughs> you wouldn't hear anything. Yeah, but... Hello and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we yeah. could introduce them. Yeah, it would sound like a seagull <laughs> farting in town. <laughs> um, so now we go to your number one. The final one for me and my number one metal band of the 21st century... Uh, I mentioned that Corey Taylor would be the vocalist on Mount Rushmore for 21st Century Vocalist. Yes. This guy would also be on there for me. And for me, these guys slightly trump Slipknot. Slightly trump Slipknot. Oh, this is a um, big claim. This is a very big claim for the uh, community. If you've listened to the show um, on the Amrocks, you know I'm pretty obsessed with these guys. I, obviously, as I said, Iron Maiden are my number one love. will always love them. But these guys, you know, I, I was going through a pretty rough patch in my life and it was just I was just picking up the albums from these guys and listening to them over and over again I listened to them when I was growing up and I, I resonated with them but I didn't quite, it didn't quite hit the button I just thought oh yeah they're pretty good but it wasn't until I was going through some pretty crap times that yeah. these guys just really picked it for me and helped me find the rage and kind of suppress my anger and stuff and this is Lamb of God Oh, oh. So, Lamb of God are my number one pick for um, 21st century metal band. Oh, Lamb wow, of God. Um, obviously, Randy Bly on um, vocals. Fantastic vocalist. Such a good screamer. Doesn't sing much. I don't think he's ever really done any much singing. Not mostly really, not, just screaming. Not what I've heard. But again, lyrically, um, the musical composition, and it's got a Lamb of God's got a very unique rhythm to it. It's, mm. it's uh, very groovy. They're d defined as groove metal, so it's Ooh. got a very kind of, you know, guitars are going fast, but the drums are going slow. Yeah. It's kinda, it creates that juxtaposition, but it's got this difficult, when you when you feel the music, you feel yourself swaying a certain way, and yeah. it's kind of got that jumping motion. Um, just unbelievable musicianship. And if you ever go and see them live, you will fear for your absolute life. It is one of those gigs where you are just. Um, I remember the first time I ever seen them. It was Brayhead Arena in 2015, right. and I was absolutely terrified um, that I was going to get swapped up into the pit. And then the second time I seen them, they supported Slayer on their farewell tour, oh. and I went right up the front because that was that kind of time where I was getting into them. And uh, the final time I seen them was Download 2019, and I was right up the front. And I spent most of the gig just dodging people's feet <laughs> um, because it was very, you know, like getting kicked in the face one minute and I fell down in the mud at one point. It was it was uh, an experience. Yes. Um, but the, nothing gets a crowd going like Lamb of God. They're just phenomenal musicians. Um, unfortunately, they had to part ways with their drummer, Chris Adler, uh, recently, and they've brought out a new album with their drummer, Art Cruz. Um, and I, I think the new album's phenomenal. Um, I think they've just had a bit of a falling out with, with Drummer. Um, but what was cool about Brayhead, I was coming that, they were supporting Megadeth. Yes. And at the time, Megadeth didn't have a drummer, so Chris Adler was playing for Lamb of God. And then he came straight back on and played for Megadeth. Oh, So he man. just he just did like a double set, but unfortunately Chris isn't there anymore. Um, it just shows you the skill that he had. Oh, definitely. Um, he's got his own solo stuff that's coming out now, and it's, it's pretty interesting to listen to, but... Um, and Lamb of God, they've just got this really interesting history 
you know, Randy Bly's got a book out about you know his alcoholism. He is an alcoholic, and he talks about him getting through that. But also, I, I don't know if you're familiar with like an incident that happened in 2012 when he was arrested for manslaughter and yes, and I'm familiar. Yeah, yes. so um, allegedly had you know there was people breaking into the the stage and he formed one person off the stage and he'd hit his head, went into a coma and unfortunately he passed away but there was not any evidence to suggest that, you know, Randy had actually threw him off the stage but if you want to know more about that, I could bore you to death for hours about that but yes. there's a fantastic yeah. documentary um, called I think it's called um, As the Palace is Born after the second record um, watch it because it's, it's about his journey into the, you know in prison and you know how he, how he coped with that and the, the court case um, and you know about his alcoholism as well so if you if you want a good metal documentary that's a good one to watch oh definitely yeah, that definitely um, and do you know just like they've, they, again kind of like Trivium they've had that roller coaster where they've got some absolutely amazing stuff you know Ashes of the Wake um, you know one of the most iconic metal albums of the early 21st century mm. um, but then you know they've got like Wrath where they took a bit of a dip and but they came back with I think after like all that crap happened with Randy in prison they came back with all this really awesome material and mm-hmm. it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon well, so that's good yeah definitely, definitely. that Lama God's one of my bands that gets me pumped up ready to go sounds like it yeah and I believe that we have covered our list. That's the list, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I have go. to say, it's been some great bands, like a wee bit of memory lane for all of us as well. Good. Yeah, and it's, it's good that we're kind of resonating on the same thing with Killswitch and Gage and all that. As yeah, well. definitely. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a couple of bands that linked in together. Like, and there were just other bands that weren't maybe on each other's lists, but we could appreciate the styles and the culture yeah. and, and how they resonate with the community like, that we are fortunate to be a part of. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, once again Jack it's been an absolute pleasure having no worries. you on thank you so much for yeah. having me it's been really good it's been a really good discussion been yeah, loving it definitely so. well, make sure to tune in to Ironworks on Thursdays at 7pm on well, scotlandrocksradio.com yes mm-hmm. you can follow us on Instagram as well and um, we do a lot of our social media on there so yes yeah, so, uh, be sure to provide us with say, some what, links to your shows and what, any upcoming projects that you have please absolutely. let us know what, yeah. and Hopefully, well, if time permits, I would love to have you back on the show again. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. So until next time, this is Andrew jo- Andrew Durning. And Jack Reed. Saying take care, stay safe, bye-bye. Keep it metal. See you later. <laughs>